Today we talk about the graphs of sine and cosine. Project number five is officially due today, so look for that date right there to make sure you're on track in terms of that project. Project six is officially assigned. You will find it on Moodle. It's due three classes from today. So you can look for a due date there next to class 21. Also note that we have a quiz next class based on the material for classes 16, 17, and what we covered today. Number one, lots to do today, so let's make haste. We start by we start this section by filling in a few more coordinates on the unit circle. You'll fill in the rest for homework. We begin with the multiples of 45 degrees by refreshing our memories on the leftmost special triangle below. We'll force the hypotenuse to have a length of one so that we can superimpose a copy of it on our unit circle to help us identify the coordinates of some points on the unit circle. So um, a few classes ago, I said that I memorized the sides of the 45, 45, 90 triangle be one, one, and radical two. But that triangle will not fit in our unit circle uh, with the hypotenuse of radical two. I needed to have hypotenuse of one. So what we're going to do is divide all three sides by square root of two. And so it's still 45, 45, 90, but the good news is here that the sides are now going to have, um, that the hypotenuse is now going to be a one, and that these other sides are going to have uh, numbers that will be useful to us in terms of the unit circle. So let's jump back to the unit circle and see if we can fill in some of the blanks using that. So you'll have to go back a few pages to find your unit circle. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, looking to fill in some coordinates here. So uh, take a look at this 45 degree angle right here. I'm going to draw something in which I'm going to erase soon enough, but uh, if I draw this triangle in, then the hypotenuse is one because it's a unit circle. And then we just found that this 45, 45, 90 triangle has sides one over root two and one over root two. So the coordinates of this point up here are x, which is this guy, one over root two, and then y, which is this guy, one over root two. So I'm going to erase all of this stuff and ultimately just put in the one over root twos. But we get to put it in there because we could superimpose that right triangle, the 45, 45, 90. Okay, and then we can play the same game over here at the 135 angle. So this triangle right here is 45, 45, 90. And so this vertical is a 1 over root 2, so that's the y coordinate. And then this horizontal is 1 over root 2, so that's the x coordinate, except. One of these is negative, right? Because we had to go left. So that must actually be a negative one over root two. So this is negative one over root two and positive one over root two. Okay, there are two more points just like these two that are down below in the third and fourth quadrants. So pause the video and fill in those two blanks. Come back when you're done. So hopefully we've got those filled in correctly. And I'm actually going to make this one red just for consistency. Okay, uh, while we're here, we never ended up filling in the points for the um, extremes of the circle, the top left, bottom, and right. So uh, let's fill those in now so that we have more stuff filled in. So we know that uh, this point out here is 0, 1, and we know the point at the top is 1, 0. At the left is negative uh, 1, comma 0. Uh, something is wrong. This guy up at the top is 0, 1. Uh, negative 1, 0 on the left, and then 0, negative 1 at the bottom. So there actually aren't that many things left to fill in in this unit circle. It's nearly complete. We just need to get information about the 30 degree angle and the 60 degree angle because everything that's left is some multiple of 30 degrees. So let's go back to the page we were on. And, um, and we'll fill in the blanks on this 30, 60, 90 triangle. So I'll do this and then I'll erase it. Uh, I have memorized the sides of this triangle are one and two and square root of three. 
But again, we can't squeeze that one into our right uh, into our unit circle unless the hypotenuse is a one. So we're going to divide everything by two in order to shrink this guy down to a one. So divide by two, divide by two, and ultimately we'll just put here on the sides that um, that are going to fit into our unit circle. So this is a one. That's what we wanted. This is a one half. This is a root three over two. Okay, so given that, let's go back to our unit circle again, and now we can fill in, I think, everything else. Okay, so again, I'll draw a lot of stuff, which I'll erase. Ultimately, I just want to figure out what goes in here, but I will draw that right triangle. This is a 30 degree angle. We just figured out the sides are one half here, root three over two down here, and the hypotenuse is one, of course. And that means that the x and the y, which is what we're after up here, uh, let's see, the x is this number, root three over two, so that goes there. And then the y is that number, one half. So again, I'm gonna erase all that stuff, ultimately just gonna fill in the coordinates here at the end. So uh, we had said that this was a root three over two and a one over two. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this point up here. So I'll draw this triangle in as well. Let's do this one in uh, purple. So this triangle has a 60 degree angle in it and a 90, so the other one's a 30. The sides have moved around a little bit. Hypotenuse is still one, but now the short side is down here is a one half and the long side is the vertical root three over two. And so then we can fill in the coordinates. The x up here must be a half, and the y must be root 3 over 2. So I'll erase all this stuff. Ultimately, we just want those coordinates. 1 half here, root 3 over 2 here. OK, let's do one more, and then you're going to pause. Um, so let's uh, look at this one up here. So that guy right there has the same coordinates as this point over here, except one of the coordinates is negative. Which one is negative? Well, the x is negative and the y is the same. So this one must be a negative a half because we went left and then a positive root three over two. So that's what goes in the blank here. So I'd like you to pause the video here and then fill in the other coordinates that are blank. Everything should be filled in by the end and then come back when you're done. Okay, so hopefully we did okay here. You just wanna check that you have the same as I have written in there. And then looking in the bottom quadrants here, that one has both negatives, so does that one. And then double check here and here. And so with this completed unit circle, we can find all kinds of things like, uh, for example, the sine of 300 degrees. Well, here's the 300 degree angle. We know that the sine is the y coordinate, so the sine must be negative root 3 over 2. And you can play that game with all of these special angles. Everyone that's up here, you can figure out what the sine is, you can figure out what the cosine is, and you can figure out what the tangent is by taking the y divided by the x. So um, just in terms of uh, making it easier, if you wanted to try to memorize um, some of the diagram that's in front of you, I'll remind you again that uh, there is a nice pattern happening with all the numbers that are up here. Um, so let's uh, see if we can put this up here. Uh, we have uh, a pattern. Here's the pattern. Um, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2. So. Some of these numbers exist on this page. Uh, let's see, square root of three over two, we see that number and it's here and it's here and it's here. It's a lot of places on this page. And then square root of two over two is actually just the rationalized form of this number, right? We saw that before. If you multiply top and bottom of this thing right here by um, square root of two, then you'll see that uh, 1 over square root of 2 is exactly the same as root 2 over 2. Okay, so root 2 over 2 is everywhere. It's everywhere there's a 45 degree angle. 
and then root one over two, well, that's just a half. It's a funny way to write a half, but anyway, I'm writing it that way because it's part of a pattern. And a half appears every place we have a 30 or a 60. And then why don't we just go ahead and continue the pattern? So that takes care of all of the, like that takes care of all of the numbers that are here and in the same places around the circle. But what about the, the extreme numbers, the zeros and the ones? You know, can we extend our pattern? Well, let's just continue with our pattern. Uh, if we continue on the left, square root of zero over two. And if we continue on the right, square root of four over two. Well, goodness, this is wonderful because the square root of zero over two is just zero, which is a bunch of places around this circle. And the square root of four over two is just one which is a bunch of places around the circle. So we've got this wonderful pattern to help you remember exactly where things are on the circle. Those are the five numbers that appear over and over and over again in this circle. And they appear um, in that nice pattern up at the top. Square root of zero over two, square root of one over two, square root of two over two, etc. cetera. Um, I'll also point out that if we look at the three numbers in the middle, those are the ones that occur most often. Uh, this is the small number. This is the medium number, and then this is the large number of the three that are in the middle here. And so I just want to highlight that there are a lot of small numbers, a lot of small lengths that appear in this picture. So I'm going to write down in green here lots of places where the distance of one half exists. So uh, first of all, this vertical distance right here is a half. So this horizontal distance is a half. This horizontal distance is a half, this vertical distance is a half, and the same thing down below. Then we can, uh, let's do in red, lots of places where we see this root 2 over 2. So root 2 over 2 is this horizontal distance, it's also this vertical distance, it's this horizontal distance and this vertical distance, and the same thing below. And then finally, how about in blue, we'll do the big one which is this root 3 over 2. So root 3 over 2 is this vertical distance, and it is this horizontal distance. And it's also this horizontal distance, and did I hit that one already? Oh, and uh, this vertical distance right here. So if you look around, and we just say that, um, you know, like our three colors here, we've got green is small, and red is medium, and blue is big. If you can just identify whether you're looking at the small, medium, or big line segment, then you can know whether it's root 1 over 2, or root 2 over 2, or root 3 over 2. So again, more patterns, and, um, and maybe a way to help remember which one is which. Your three choices are small, medium, and large. And if you just look at the diagram, hopefully you can see, oh, this length right here, that's a large. This length right here is a medium. This length right here is a small. And if you can then associate small, medium, and large with these three numbers, then you know everything there is to know about this unit circle. OK, so we've got our completed unit circle. I think that's good. Let's go ahead and jump back to where we were in the notes. Okay, we've already done number three, filling in the coordinates of the unit circle. Number four, our next task is to graph the functions y equals sine theta and y equals cosine theta. Let's try graphing y equals sine theta using our special points from the unit circle. Okay, so let's just make a quick uh, table here. So we're going to have theta, and then we're going to have y equals sine theta. So we're going to put our special angles in here. But notice that this diagram here is in terms of pi's, which means it's a radian diagram. So let's try to get used to the idea of using radian measures. So uh, special angles for radians, zero radians, that's where we start. And then the first special angle in that first quadrant, normally we call it 30 degrees, but it's actually pi over something. So um, hopefully with some practice, we start to understand um, uh, what the special angles are in terms of radians. So that's pi over six. The next special angle is 45 degrees, but that's just pi over something else in radians. It's 4. The next one is 60 degrees, but that's pi over something. It's 3. And then at the top of our circle, 90 degrees is really pi over 2. And then it's going to, um, well, we'll just do one more. Uh, the next one here is, uh, what's the next one? Is it 2 pi over 3?
Okay, so um, so let's start filling in some of these numbers now. Uh, sine of zero, well, we know it's just the y-coordinate of that point on the far right of the circle, and the y-coordinate there is zero, so zero, zero. Sine of pi over six, so jump back to that unit circle. Have it in front of you here. Sine of pi over six, you're just looking for the uh, y-coordinate at pi over six, and we see that that's a half. I'm gonna write it as a decimal, 0.5. Next one is sine of pi over four. So you can see from your unit circle that that's one over root two or radical two over two. I'm gonna write that as a decimal as well. You can type it in if you want to, but it's about 0.7. Next one, sine of pi over three. So grab the y coordinate of that pi over three angle and you should see it's root three over two. Uh, if you type that into a calculator, you get about 0.87. And then finally, pi over two is at the top. What's the y coordinate up there at the top? It is one. And then we'll do one more, that's two pi over three. So the y coordinate there, again, it's root three over two, which again is about 0.87. So we're just gonna plot these, we have six points. So the horizontal is the angle and the vertical is the sine value. So zero, zero is the origin. And then we're at um, pi over six. So actually maybe we need to label the, uh, the horizontal axis here a little bit more. So if pi is here, that means that this one right here must be a pi over two, and this one here must be a pi over four. Okay, fair enough. Um, so why don't we jump to the pi over four one, which is this guy. So that, that's at about 0.7. So pi over four goes up to 0.7, maybe it's around here. And pi over six, which is a little less than that, is actually at 0.5. So we'll plot this point right here, uh, a little bit less than, it's not halfway, but it's a little bit less, so maybe something around there. Okay, and then we've got this next one at pi over three, uh, which is a little bit to the uh, right of pi over four, and that's at 0.87, which is pretty close to the top. Maybe not quite that close. Okay, and then pi over two, that's an easy one to plot. That's at the top, that's at one. So we're up here. And then when we get to two pi over three, which is a little bit bigger, we're back at 0.87. So we've got this kind of symmetric point, so that blue one over here. And so I'm just gonna connect the dots in some smooth way. It's gonna look an awful lot like a graph that we've graphed a few times before. We had Ferris wheel, we had a temperature oscillating back and forth. I think it was between like 30 degrees and 110 degrees. And, um, and then it continues and eventually hits back here at pi because remember pi radians is half a revolution. So that lands us back at the left-hand point of the unit circle. And the y coordinate at that point is zero. And then what happens? Well, I'm not gonna make any more of my table, but what happens to those y coordinates for angles that are between pi and two pi? So these are the angles that are in the third and fourth quadrants on that unit circle. What can you say about the sine values of those angles? That is, um, uh, what can you say about the y-coordinates of those points on the unit circle? Well, by virtue of being in the third and fourth coordinates, they're all negative. And so we're gonna get the same numbers that we had up above, but they're gonna be negative. And so this graph is just gonna continue down here. It'll be like the symmetric part of what's up there, but just the negatives. So that is one um, period of the sine graph. It uh, starts at the origin right here. It goes up to the top comes back to the x-axis, goes to the bottom, and then repeats. Now it's kind of misleading for me to say it starts here because this is only one part of the graph, but we could continue, and we could continue and this graph actually goes forever in both directions. So it doesn't really have a starting point at all. Um, I'm just gonna call wherever it is on the y-axis the starting point. So I'm okay saying it starts in the middle, but know that I don't mean it in the traditional sense because there's no starting point. It goes forever this way too. Number five, we could see a pretty picture of the sine curve and the cosine curve on GSP class 18. So here's the file. Um, so if I drag this point right here, you can see that this uh, ray or this line segment rotates around. So that gives us a bigger and bigger angle. And that angle is actually gonna get measured uh, here horizontally. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first think about the sine of this angle. So is the sine the X or the Y coordinate on the unit circle? It's the y. 
So the sine of this angle is just this vertical distance, whatever it is. So we're going to show that vertical distance right there, and we're going to translate it right over here. So that's the same as this line segment. So if I um, give a bigger angle, and you can see that the coordinate gets higher on the circle, and so we get a bigger sine value, which it gets copied over here. So if we come back here and we decide to trace this top point right here, and then we'll start way back at the beginning. So sine of zero is zero, we saw that. And then the sine curve got bigger, bigger, bigger until we got to the top of the circle. So you're looking right up here, which corresponded to a height of one. And then as the angle proceeds, the sine value now is gonna get smaller until it gets to here where it'll become zero. And so we keep going until we get to there. So we're right now back there at zero because the Y coordinate is zero. And now the line segment is gonna get bigger again, but it'll have a negative value because the Y values are all negative down here. So it continues on bigger, bigger, bigger negative stuff until we get there to the bottom. So at three pi over two or 270 degrees, we have a value of negative one, it's a min. And then it is gonna get smaller, but still negative until we get to the start. So that right there is the graph that we just drew, and that is um, one period of the sine graph. Okay, so now we're gonna take a quick look at the graph of cosine. So cosine at the uh, point is the x coordinate. So we don't wanna see that red, which is the y coordinate. I wanna hide that thing, and I wanted to show the x coordinate, which is this distance right here. So this is gonna be a little bit trickier. But the idea here is that this blue line segment has exactly the same length as that blue line segment. So as we make that uh, angle bigger right now, the blue line segments both get smaller. You can see this small thing, this small line segment is translated over here to this small line segment. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the graph of this. We'll trace this top point right here. And we'll see the cosine graph. So it started very big. And now the cosine as we get up to this top point all right, I'll just drag this manually. So the cosine as we get to the top point right up there, how much is the X coordinate at that top point? It's zero. And now what's gonna to happen to the X coordinates of these points? Well, they're all gonna be negative. So we expect this guy is gonna go under the axis, all negative. There is as far left as it will ever be. So the cosine is uh, negative. And then as the angle gets bigger still, um, you can see that these x values are still negative, but getting smaller, closer to zero, which they hit right there at the bottom of the circle, which is why, we're, again, we're on the x-axis here. And then finally, as we go to the right, positive uh, x-coordinates and getting bigger, bigger until it maxes out back at one when we get to the two pi radians. So that right there is the graph of cosine. And it looks an awful lot like the graph of sine. Um, in fact, uh, maybe we can show the graph of sine as well. So we'll just animate this thing here, and then we can see both. So um, sine and cosine, let's see, sine is in red, cosine is in blue. They look pretty much exactly the same. They're just shifted horizontally from each other. They're not that different. Um, the only thing I'll say is that uh, I'd like you to just know that cosine starts at the top, and sine starts in the middle. Again, the word starts is not ideal because these graphs continue to the left forever, but um, on the y-axis, the cosine point is up there at the top and coming down, and the sine point is in the middle and going up. Okay, uh, number six, let's, let's, let's list some properties of these two curves. So domain, so remember the domain is the allowable inputs. You can plug any angle you want into these curves and get some number that makes sense. So the domain here is all real numbers. Or if you prefer, you can say all the thetas uh, from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, the range, well, the bottom range is the outputs. So the bottom is at negative one and the top is at one, and we hit both of those numbers. So um, the range is all the guys between minus one and one. Okay, let's think about symmetry. So looking up at this graph right here, if I were to continue this graph to the left, then what kind of symmetry would you say this graph has? Is it symmetric over the y-axis? No, because if it were, 
then this piece would get translated up here. Is it symmetric over the x-axis? No, if it were, this piece would get translated down here. Is it symmetric over the origin? Yes, because for example, this point goes straight through the origin to a corresponding point, and this point goes straight through the origin to a corresponding point, and if we continued, eventually we'd find this point going straight through the origin to some corresponding point. So the sine graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. So the sine graph is symmetric with respect to, that's the WRT, with respect to the origin. And then the cosine graph, so we don't actually have a cosine graph here in front of us, so let's sketch one real quick. So we said cosine starts at the top and it's on its way down. And if we continue that thing on the left-hand side, starts at the top and then heading down. So what kind of symmetry uh, does this graph have? So hopefully we see that this graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Okay, the period is the horizontal distance uh, over which, uh, for which this graph repeats. Sine and cosine both repeat every 2 pi, so the period for both of these is 2 pi. The midline is the horizontal line that goes through the middle. The horizontal line that goes through the middle is the x-axis. Might be better to write that as an equation, y equals 0. Amplitude is how high or low the graph gets at its, uh, at its highest or lowest points from the middle, uh, and the amplitude in both cases for sine and cosine is 1. Number seven, with practice, I'd like you to be able to sketch a sine curve or a cosine curve with axes and tick marks labeled with accurate concavity and increasing, decreasing, and roughly to scale in less than 30 seconds. I'll demonstrate for you now. Start the clock. Okay, so we'll draw our axes. We'll make this thing repeat out here at 2 pi. Pi is there in the middle, pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2. And I also know that this thing gets up to 1 and down to minus 1. And if I wanted to graph, for example, the cosine curve, I know it starts at the top, hits the x-axis, bottoms out at pi, hits the x-axis, and gets up to the top. And then it repeats on both sides. So with a little bit of practice, should be able to draw something um, pretty quickly that looks like sine or cosine. Number eight. Once we're, able, once we're comfortable with these two new graphs, we should be able to transform them. Take a look at the transformations reference sheet. You can find it on Moodle if you want a refresher about transformations. Number nine, we can use these curves as our parent functions. Note that I might use t instead of theta. So right here are just two uh, computer generated versions of the graphs we've just drawn. Cosine again starts at the top on the y-axis on its way down. Sine starts in the middle on its way up. Number 10, let's sketch the graph of y equals 0.5 cosine of t. Okay, so we know that cosine of t normally starts at 1. What does a 0.5 do when you multiply a function by 0.5? So this is hopefully a review, but this is a vertical compression. Right, all the y values become half of what they once were. So instead of starting, so I'm going to draw my cosine curve here, uh, and then it bottoms out there, and then it goes up here. So first, just a regular old cosine curve. And then all of the y values now become half of what they were. So instead of being up at 1, it's now at a half. This guy is at 0. It's still 0, because half of 0 is 0. And then uh, instead of at minus 1, whoops. Instead of minus 1, it's now at minus a half. Half of 0 is still 0. And then this guy gets up to a half here. And so then we can draw this transformed cosine graph right here. And say that's at uh, y equals 0.5 cosine t. Number 11, we observed that multiplying the front of sine or cosine by a constant affects the amplitude. The amplitude of y equals a sine of t and y equals a cosine of t is, so it's actually not quite a, it's the absolute value of a. So the amplitude of this one right here was 0.5. But even if this had been a negative in the front, the amplitude would still be 0.5. So the amplitude is always a positive number, which is why we have absolute value. 
Okay, now let's sketch the graph of y equals sine of t minus 1. So let's do that here on the axes below. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is graph sine of t. We'll do this in green. So remember, sine of t starts where? Top, middle, or bottom? It starts in the middle, and it's on its way up, back to the middle, to the bottom, and then back to the start to repeat. So here's y equals sine of t. And then we're trying to take our function and graph the function itself, but minus 1 on the outside. So what does subtracting 1 on the outside of a function do? So we know that this thing right here moves the graph down 1. So all we have to do is plot these five points, but all down 1. So instead of being at the origin, it starts down there. Instead of being up at 1, it's now at 0. This guy is at negative 1. This guy is now down at negative 2, and then down to negative 1. y equals sine of t minus 1. And you might be able to graph this thing a little bit quicker without plotting the five points, but I think plotting five points grounds you um, and makes it so that we can graph things very accurately. Uh, I think it's too much to ask, at least in the beginning with graphing these things, to just be able to look at a transform sine or cosine equation and then just jump right to the graph. So I'd encourage you to plot the five points to um, increase accuracy. 13, thus adding a number to or subtracting a number from a trig function affects the midline. That seems reasonable. The middle used to be the x-axis, but now the middle is down here. And it uh, looks like the middle is actually just at negative 1, which maybe shouldn't be surprising. There's a negative 1 there. So then our conclusion is that the midline of y equals a sine t plus k and y equals a cosine t plus k is k. a we decided is the amplitude. The midline apparently is whatever you stick at the end. Okay, and actually I'm going to correct myself here. Maybe instead of saying uh, the midline is k, it should say the midline is y equals k. I think I was being picky before about saying that the midline was an equation. 14, on the same set of axes to the right, let's quickly sketch the graph of y equals 2 sine of t plus 3. Okay, 2 sine of t plus 3. Uh, again, you might be able to do this faster than we're about to, but I think that it's important to grab those five points. So, first thing I'm going to do is just think about the graph of y equals 2 sine of t. And we know that that doubles the y coordinates. Right? It's just a vertical, um, uh, vertical stretch. So let's go back to the green, this guy right here, which is the original sign, and we're going to double all of the y coordinates. So double zero is still zero, double one is two, that's still zero, double negative one is negative two, and that's still zero. So here's the graph of two sine of t. I've got my five points. It doesn't take very long. And then plus three. What does plus three do on the outside? So let's do this one in purple. Two sine of t plus three. So this thing right here adds three to all the y coordinates. So let's add three to the black points that are here. So the origin goes up three. Next point used to be right here. This one used to be at 2, so we go up 3 and lands us on 5. The next point was at 0, add 3 to that. Next point was negative 2, add 3 to that. Last point was 0, add 3 to that. And so without too much effort, we can graph our most complicated sine function to date, 2 sine of t plus 3. Okay, on the next page, 15. We can change the period by doing a horizontal stretch or compression. I'll give you a formula in a minute, but let me show you a way to figure out the period of a trig function in case you forget the formula. Let's figure out the period of y equals sine of 2t. Okay, so normally y equals sine of t has a period of 2 pi. It repeats every 2 pi. And so what that means is if you plug 2 pi into the sine function, 
it's the same as plugging zero in. You've just gone full circle, literally. So I, I guess what, what we're saying here is that if you can make this thing in here equal to two pi, then you have found um, the end of one cycle. So let's take this thing right here and set it equal to two pi. Always two pi because that's one complete revolution. And once we've done that, we know we've repeated. So we're going to take 2t, which is this thing inside, and set it equal to 2 pi, always 2 pi. And we're going to solve for t. In this case, we just get t equals pi. What does that mean? Well, t equals pi is the period. Because if you plug t equals pi in here, then how much is that? Well, when t is pi, this thing is 2 times pi, which is 2 pi. And we know that sine of 2 pi just gets us right back to where we started. So plugging t equals pi gets us back to where we started. 16, here's the formula I promised you. The period of y equals a sine of bt plus k. Well, we've, we're getting more and more complicated, but let's review. a is the amplitude. y equals k is the midline. b is really the only new thing. But the period of that thing and the period of the same thing, but where you have a, oops, where you have a cosine instead of a sine. Uh, the period of both is 2 pi divided by absolute value of b. So, for example, for this one, the period is 2 pi divided by absolute value of b. Remember, b is the number touching the t, which is 2 in this case. So this is just 2 pi over 2, or pi, which agrees with what we did before. So in general, if you don't want to think about stuff, you just memorize this formula. Period is 2 pi over b. 17, let's sketch the graph of y equals sine of 2t. All right, first I'll ask you to pause the video here and uh, plot the five points for, um, for y equals sine of t. So pause the video, plot those five points, and come back. Once you've got your points plotted, go ahead and connect the dots. That's our ordinary sine graph. But now we're doing sine of 2t. Okay, so we just said that that means that the period is actually pi. So somehow this thing is supposed to end one cycle not at 2 pi, but actually ended at pi. The whole graph is supposed to be um, supposed to have one complete cycle just in this space instead of in this space. Okay, well let's. Uh, before we go further, let's review a little bit about the transformation that's happening here. Um, if you ask me to do something like f of 2t, I would say that this 2 is a horizontal compression. That's a transformation thing. This has nothing to do with sine graphs. But anytime you graph f of 2t, the graph will look the same as the graph of f of t, except it's a horizontal compression. And what happens is you um, multiply the x-coordinates by 1 over 2, 1 divided by that number that's in front of the t. I guess I shouldn't say x-coordinates, I should say t-coordinates. So all of the t's become half of what they used to be, and that's how we're going to get the horizontal compression. And that's how we're going to get this sine graph to happen faster. So all of the t's happen at half of what they used to be. So for example, uh, this point right up here, uh, let's label the coordinates of this point right here. It used to be pi over 2 comma 1. That's our top point. But now the t coordinate becomes half of what it used to be. So if I take half of this number, half of that number becomes pi over 4. But the y is unaffected. This is just a horizontal thing. So the 1 gets copied. So the new point is pi over 4 comma 1, which is right here. Pi over 4 comma 1. Okay, let's take a look at this next point right here. This number is pi comma 0. The t coordinate, first coordinate gets cut in half, and you copy the y. So you cut that t coordinate in half, and we get pi over 2, which is this guy and you keep the y-coordinate the same, so this is the point pi over 2 comma 0. And let's do two more points. Uh, this one down here 
is at 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1. Cut the t in half, and it becomes 3 pi over 4, and you keep the y value the same. So 3 pi over 4 negative 1 is there. And then finally, last one, this is at 2 pi comma 0. Cut the t in half, it becomes just pi. Keep the y the same, and it becomes pi 0, which is already there, but I'll plot it in blue now. And then one more point, 0, 0. Cut the t in half, it stays. So then our new graph in purple, it's these five blue points. And everything that we said was going to happen has happened. We horizontally compressed by a factor of 2 by multiplying all those t coordinates by 1 over 2. Uh, the y coordinates stayed exactly the same. And hopefully we can see that the period of this purple thing is pi. We completed one full cycle in pi instead of having to wait until 2 pi. And if you wanted to, you could draw another copy of this thing right here. And we'll say that this purple is y equals sine of 2t. And if you've taken a physics course before, you might have seen this too called the frequency, um, which means how many uh, complete cycles you get up until 2 pi. So if we just look between 0 and 2 pi, how many cycles, how many complete cycles did we get for purple? We got two of them, two copies of that sine graph. We have two copies of the sine graph right there. How many copies of the black do we see between 0 and 2 pi? Just one, which is the number that's in front of that t. So that's called the frequency. OK, 18. Now we'll sketch y equals 3 cosine of pi over 5 t. We'll make our own axes with the special points marked. This will take a few minutes. OK, so let's give this a shot. So um, first thing I want to do is figure out the period. And we saw our formula up above as 2 pi divided by b. Technically, b should be an absolute value. 2 pi divided by the number touching t, which is pi over 5. So you should be able to clean that up without a calculator. Hopefully, we see this is 10. The one thing I always like to do is take the period and divide by 4, four quadrants, four natural parts of the sine and cosine graphs. So 10 over 4, or 2 and a half. So the special y value, special uh, t values are all going to be multiples of 2 and a half. So let's just go ahead and mark those multiples of 2 and a half now. So 2.5 and 5, 7.5, and then finally 10 will be the end of our cycle. And the amplitude here is just the a value. Again, it should be absolute value. And the a value is the number in front of cosine, which is 3. So this graph is going to get up to 3 and down to minus 3. So um, let's see, if 2.5 is this distance, then 3 is just a little bit bigger. So roughly to try to keep it to scale, we'll go 3 there and negative 3 there. And you can just dive in and try to draw the cosine curve, but I like plotting my five points every time. This cosine start at the bottom, middle, or top. It starts at the top, so we'll plot our point right, at, right up there at the top. And then it goes down to the middle, and it keeps going down to the bottom, back up to the middle, back up to the top, the starting point. And then we connect the dots with a smooth curve. Don't forget, it's getting ready to turn around. So notice that I didn't hit this thing like it was taken off in a rocket. We're, if we're drawing more of these, it's on its way back down. Same kind of thing over here. It's turning around. So that right there is the graph of 3 cosine pi over 5 times t. And of course, you could always use your calculator to confirm. So let's type this in here. 3 cosine of uh, pi over 5 times x. So um, instead of just hitting graph, let's think carefully about the window. I want it to be this window. So it looks like my x's are 0 to 10. So I'll go 0 to 10 there. And my y's are minus 3 to 3. And so if I've done this correctly, then my graph should essentially take up most of this window. It should start at the top left, bottom out at the middle, and end at the top right. There's one more thing that I should check. But I'm going to hit graph first anyway, and it looks like things are looking pretty good. 
but it's possible that you did everything I just did and your graph doesn't look anything like this. It might just be like this kind of horizontal line up there at the top. So what's going on is that we're in radiant mode and if the calculator is not, then you're not gonna get a good graph. So I had mentioned before that anytime I hit sine or cosine or tangent, I think about my mode. So if you're in the wrong mode, we'll get a graph that is not very exciting. And so if you get one of these horizontal graphs, there's a good chance that you're in the wrong mode. So this is pretty good. It looks just like we had said over here. Okay, down here at 19, you should also be able to draw the graphs of y equals negative cosine t and y equals sine of negative t, but I'll let you think about those on your own. Most of the graphs we've sketched above are included after the learning objectives for your reference. Okay, the activity is on the next page, but give it a shot on your own before you check the answer key or the video.